Miss Southridge. My name is Kelsey, and I'm actually a student over at Western in London, so I have to take in this service from afar, so I know that sometimes it can be a little bit awkward in this online format. But if this is your first time joining us, I want to offer a couple tips to make the most out of this experience. First, be sure to crank up the volume during the music and sing along. And musicians, download the music charts in the video below and grab your instrument and play along too. If English isn't your first language or your experience hearing, cha hearing challenges, we encourage you to turn on the closed captioning for the video or download the transcripts of the morning's message. And also, be sure to download the Southridge app. This is the latest way to stay connected and informed on everything that's going on here at Planet Southridge. It's completely free and super easy to use. For the next hour, I invite you to engage in this experience as if you were here with us, surrounded by a community of diverse, curious, open-minded, and inclusive people, as we're all desiring to tap into the power and presence of God together, as we worship, pray, listen, laugh, and grow. And now, there might be some things that we do or say today that really resonate with you, and that's great. But there might also be some things that stretch and challenge you, and we think that's good too. But ultimately, we encourage you to engage openly, thoughtfully, honestly, and wholeheartedly, trusting that the God we're here to connect with is the God who, above all else, is love. So as we begin our time together, wherever and whenever you are, if you've been around for the f like forever, or if this is your very first time, we hope that for the next hour you feel like you're among friends. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Is God more than a traffic cop, enforcing rules that are all made up? A lengthy list of do's and don'ts, some rules we may not even know. All meant to keep us inside the lines, and for every failure, eternal fines. A prison sentence like a jail, no parole, no chance of bail. Is God more than an aging grouch who's out of reach and out of touch? Who's hard of hearing when we pray? Has God retired or moved away, a divine drifter who won't return, has got a dog too old to learn new tricks and new philosophies, blown over by even the gentlest breeze, has got an ancient artifact whose authenticity cannot be tracked, and all that's left is some old book and a treasure map for those who'll look. But will we find that pot of gold, or just a bill of goods we've all been sold? And will our hopes just disappoint and leave us with an unfilled void? It's got a riddle we must solve before our sins can be absolved. A code to crack, a truth concealed, a secret that must be revealed. A puzzle we must piece together if we want to live forever. Is God just playing hide and seek to feed some insecurity? The child who needs to hear us say how much they're needed every day. And when we do, face peeks out, but then disappears again behind our doubt. And we're left to wonder if he's really there. If he is, does he even care? It's got a crutch for weaker souls, trying to fill some inner holes. A figment of our foolish minds, a product of much simpler times. An easy answer for the universe. A bubble scientists have burst. It's got a raving lunatic who laughs at things that would make us sick. It's got a scientist gone mad, a senseless fool. Have we been had? Are we more than dancing bears who live to please God, who cares more for personal pleasure than our pain? Is life some random, pointless game? Is there some lesson we must learn? Or is all this just to make us squirm, a test that we can never pass, a concept we will never grasp? And if, exhausted, we give up, wondering, do we simply not have enough faith to just believe? God cries, who are you to question me? Still, all these questions persist and persist. So if you really do exist, is there some point that we have missed? God, is there more to you than this? Whoa. 
circle now
His blood, you are salvation, you are salvation, one king so worthy. This is Jesus, the hope of glory. This is Jesus, there's no is the anthem that never dies. You are the way in the truth and the light. You are our victory. Yeah, you are our victory.
God breathing, God walking, God healing, God speaking, God weeping. This is Jesus. This is Jesus. Christ bleeding. Christ died. Glad you're here. <laughs> that sounded really weird. Yeah. You need to take a good look too because you ain't never gonna see another one like me. <laughs> we invite you. Nope. You forgot the whole line that you made. The whole line. We are a diverse community of imperfect people who see the church as less of something to go to and more of a life to be lived and shared with others. We are continually growing in what it means to love one another, fighting for unity rather than fighting over unnecessary arguments. We are living to serve this world in the way of Jesus, serving those in need and those on the margins, knowing that friendship truly makes the difference. So if you're coming with questions or curiosities, hurts or frustrations, joys or celebrations, wondering if the church can bring clarity or hope, or simply be a place to belong. We invite you to be at home with us. We invite you to explore with us. We invite you to grow with us. And we invite you to belong with us. Welcome to Southridge. We're glad you're here. Hey there, my name is Jessica Reimer and I serve as the Director of Connection here at Southridge. We're so glad that you're participating with us and we hope that this has already been a meaningful time for you. So I'm here in our St. Catharines location and if you've never joined us for one of our in-person gatherings at one of our physical Southridge locations, we would love to have you consider joining us in person when you feel ready and able. While we're so grateful to have this online platform, to share in this experience from wherever and whenever we find ourselves, we love it even more when we can gather together as a community. 
In fact, if you do come out, please come say hi to me or one of our many welcoming volunteers. And we'd love to get a small gift into your hands, just as a way of showing our appreciation for taking the time to come and meet us in person. And as even more of an incentive, we actually have monthly welcome lunches for anyone who's looking to learn more about our community and wanting to connect with some folks over some delicious food. So just check out our events page on the website to see when an upcoming welcome lunch is happening and we'd love to meet you there. If for whatever reason you're not able to or not comfortable with joining us in person, please know that actually doesn't in any way exclude you from participating in community with us. If you need to touch base with a pastor for any reason, please simply fill out one of our connect cards. We can't wait to hear from you. For those of us who call this community home, one of the ways we practice togetherness and express our gratitude to God and generosity to others is by regular financial contributions. This is one of the ways we can invest our lives in what God is doing in and through our church family, making a difference by meeting needs among us, across our region, and around the world. All of our online given op giving options are available on our website, and so if you're able to give this week, we invite you to do so in a spirit of joy and generosity, and we thank you in advance for your faithfulness. So that's it from me. Now we're going to hear this week's talk together. And as we do, I invite you to remove as many distractions as possible and listen in to what God might want to be saying uniquely to you. Have you ever noticed when you travel to major cities that there's always some dude on a horse? I'll show you what I mean in a moment. I first heard this insight from Pastor Brian Zond in a similar way that I want to share with you today, but since it had been drawn to my attention, I began to actually notice it for myself. Probably uh, the first time I was conscious of it is when Lindsay and I had an opportunity to travel to Europe. Uh, we landed in Barcelona, Spain, and we found ourselves severely jet lagged, uh, but we wanted to uh, try to get caught up with the time zone as quickly as possible and take advantage of our time in the city as much as we could. So like moments after we dropped our bags, we found ourselves on a double decker tour bus traveling the city. And I can remember distinctly when we came into the Barcelona town square, we came upon this dude on a horse in the form of a statue. Now, even though I noticed it, I remember not feeling that surprised by uh, this particular statue or this particular dude on a horse. I mean, I don't really know who he is, but I realized that this experience is not that unfamiliar or unexpected. Check out some of these other cities. Lisbon, Portugal, dude on a horse. Uh, Berlin, Germany, another dude on a horse. Uh, Rome, no surprise, a dude on a horse. In fact, I think there are lots of dudes on horses uh, in Rome. Um, check out this one I found as I was researching this a little bit more. This monstrosity is in Mongolia. Uh, it's a statue of the dude on a horse that was 12th century conqueror Genghis Khan. Now that is quite a dude on a horse. Um, bring it to this side of the Atlantic, Washington, a dude on a horse. And before we start sort of wagging our fingers at American conformity, a little closer to home, Toronto. Yes, in Toronto, there's a dude on a horse. Because it seems there's always a dude on a horse. That somehow in sort of our expectation of power and authority throughout the history of our world in the name of like freedom uh, or security or strength or justice, it's always seemed that we've needed a, a dude on a horse usually sword in hand and army in tow, conquering the world on our behalf, you know, in theory to make it a better place. Um, one dude on a horse who eventually becomes a statue at a time. But my question for us today is how has this expectation of power and authority affected our experience of and relationship with God? So as we start out this uh, Easter series, as we enter into the, the weeks of Easter together in this Unexpected God series, uh, we want to start today by looking at a story that, that may just shatter this expectation or paradigm that there's always some dude on a horse. And today we're actually going to look at the story most associated with this Sunday kind of in our church calendar, what is often referred to as Palm Sunday. So if you have access to a Bible, 
Uh, you could open it up to Luke chapter 19, where we're going to dive into this story together. A story that is kind of known to have happened right around this time in these days leading up to the events of Easter. So you can read along if you have it in front of you, or I'll just read it for us as we take in this story together. I'm starting in Luke 19, verse 29, where it says, As Jesus approached Bethpage and Bethany, uh, these were two villages just a couple miles outside of the capital city of Jerusalem. As Jesus approached Bethpage and Bethany at the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and they found it just as Jesus had told them. As they were untying the colt, its owners asked them, why are you untying the colt? They replied, the Lord needs it. So they brought it to Jesus. They threw their cloaks on the colt and then they put Jesus on it. And as he went along, people spread their cloaks on the road. When he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, uh, this was a peak of a mountain just east of Jerusalem. And this peak would have been the moment where they could see the city as they, they began to descend toward it together. When they, he came near the place where the road goes down the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all the miracles they had seen. And they shouted together, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Now this, uh, this story, this episode, um, it took place in, in Jesus' day, in the days leading up to what was called the Passover celebration. The Passover festival or celebration, it was an annual festival where the people of Israel would all come together, so to make a pilgrimage to their capital city of Jerusalem, to celebrate God's rescue of their slavery from Egypt thousands of years earlier. But by the time Jesus came around, what was a little bit ironic about the, the Passover celebration is that uh, the Jewish people now found themselves in a new and another form of of slavery as they were uh, under the occupation and oppression of the Roman Empire. And during this Passover celebration, as hundreds of thousands of, of Israelites came to Jerusalem, it was also a time where the powers of Rome made sure they sp paid special attention to Jerusalem as well. It would have been right around this same time, these days leading up to the festival, that as Jesus uh, came to the east with his from the east with his fellow pilgrims, um, the Roman governor of the area, Pontius Pilate, he was coming from his outpost in the west in Caesarea, and you guessed it, mounted atop a war horse with an entire Roman regiment in tow with him as they came into the city all as a show of force to remind the Israelites who was really in charge. And that as they celebrated, it was in their best interest to continue to cooperate and remain fully in, in line with the Roman Empire's rule. Now, we refer to the, the events in this, this story uh, as Palm Sunday. And that comes from uh, the Gospel of John's reference in this story to the pilgrims that were, were walking with Jesus, waving palm branches as they went. And this was a very significant symbol because there had been moments in Israel's history when their leaders or kings had conquered an enemy that they would celebrate by, by waving palm branches to celebrate their victory, their, the defeat that they had accomplished, and celebrate their liberation together. It also says that they, they laid their cloaks down and along the road as, as Jesus traveled. Again, a, a symbol from Israel's history that at the coronation of some of their, their earlier kings, uh, they would lay down their cloaks as a sign of honor and submission. A person's cloak was extremely valuable to them and to, to lay it down was a sign of, of respect and submission to the newly crowned king. But as we look at this story today, you might have noticed that there's one particular unexpected detail of a king who is apparently riding in to establish a new kingdom, especially in the face of a pre-existing occupying empire or an enemy. 
Because what we notice in this story is that Jesus' chosen mode of transportation doesn't actually have the horse-like characteristics and qualities that were generally needed if you were going to come into a city to overthrow an enemy. So what we see in this story is that Jesus was actually not some dude on a horse. But instead, Jesus chose to ride a donkey's colt into the city. Now, why is this a significant detail? And what, what does this say to us in this story? Why does Jesus ride a donkey? Was it simply that he didn't have access to a horse, would have preferred that, but, but couldn't, couldn't find one? I mean, it seemed like Jesus actually had a unique way of being able to, to, to access the donkey's colt that they wanted to find. But was that the reason? Or was it not significant at all? Was Jesus just kind of tired at the end of a long journey and he didn't really feel like walking the rest of the way? So he said to his disciples, hey, get me a rental car or something like that. I mean, Jesus had walked for his entire life and his entire ministry. I don't think it was that he just couldn't hack it for the last couple miles. But I think the reason the cult, the donkey's cult, is so prominent in the story is it actually reveals to us that as, as Jesus sensed that his time was coming, to really reveal who he, who he really and fully was and to inaugurate this, this new kind of kingdom in the world. He wanted to ride this donkey to show his disciples and the whole world that he was a king like they had never seen, an unexpected king. And when you look actually at the, the whole arc of the scriptures, you see that this unexpected king had, had actually been imagined or prophesied earlier. In Israel's ancient prophecies, um, it was something that maybe just had been, had been missed or misunderstood or overlooked because 600 years earlier, a prophet named Zechariah had poetically prophesied about an unexpected king. In Zechariah 9, verses 9 and 10, we read this. He wrote, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. He's talking to all the people of Israel. See, your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, and listen to this, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. On behalf of this king, he imagined, I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem, and the battle bow will be broken. This king will proclaim peace to the nations, to all the nations. He will, his rule will extend from sea to sea and to the ends of the earth. You see, Zechariah imagined a different kind of king. Zechariah imagined an unexpected king. Um, Zechariah imagined a king that, that wouldn't charge in with conquering force on a war horse but would trot slowly on a humble donkey as a sign of his surrender and sacrifice. Um, and this is not what we would expect of a king. Um, kings uh, ride war horses. Kings become kings by conquering other kingdoms. Kings overthrow their enemies by attacking with their army. And then kings are coronated with crowns and thorns. But not Jesus. As Jesus was uh, preparing to reveal the kind of kingdom he was coming to bring, he deliberately and uh, subversively sought out a donkey's colt to show that he was a different kind of king. Jesus wanted to trade the war horse for a donkey. Um, Jesus wanted to trade an army for humble apprentices and disciples. And just days later, Jesus would be crowned, not with a crown, but with thorns, and coronated not on a throne, but on a cross. Showing us that Jesus is a king who would uh, rather die for his enemies than kill them, and whose kingdom comes not through conquering force, but through co-suffering, sacrificial love. This is the king that we see through this Palm Sunday story, the king we see in Jesus, an unexpected king that changes our paradigm of authority and power and what the kings of the world can look like. And I think this is good news for us this Easter when it comes to our expectation of and relationship with God. Because what the, the 
good news of Jesus tells us and what the New Testament shows us is that um, everything we see in Jesus is actually everything we can expect of God. Following Jesus' resurrection, which we're going to celebrate together in a week, is that sort of cemented the faith in his first followers that Jesus was, in fact, the Son of God that he claimed to be. The Apostle Paul ended up writing this in Colossians chapter 1. He said, Christ Jesus is the visible image of the invisible God. That in the person of Jesus and everything Jesus has done, his life, his death, his resurrection, even the riding of a donkey, in Jesus we can see the perfect reflection and image of who God is. That what we can expect from God is everything that we see in Jesus. That if Jesus is a king um, who doesn't bring in his kingdom, doesn't come into the world with conquering force. Neither is God one who comes into our lives through conquering force. I think this is unexpected. That if we wouldn't expect sort of the powerful rulers and kings of the world to come this way, how much less would we expect the all-powerful sovereign God of the universe to come this way? But this is what we see in Jesus, and this is what we can expect of God in the most unexpected way. So my question for you this morning is, what has been your expectation of God? You know, in a world where it seems there's always some dude on a horse, and the way power is exerted is through sort of coercion and control and conquering force, how have some of these pictures actually affected your image of God, maybe in a way that has had you resist God's entry into your own life. You know, maybe um, you've thought about God kind of like a controlling parent, you know, who firmly sets the boundaries and the rules and is just kind of watching and ready to, to punish if you step out of line. Or maybe you've kind of assumed God is a little bit like a coercive boss and has just laid out, you know, such a a heavy uh, task load or burden of duty and responsibility. And you try your best to kind of live up to it with just a faint hope of a future reward, but also a dreadful consequence if you fail to succeed. Maybe you've thought that God is like a manipulative politician egocentric, attention-seeking, power-hungry, you know, just trying to arrange the world uh, for his best interest rather than the interests of his people. Or maybe at worst, like the kingdoms of this world, you've assumed God uh, wields his power like a vengeful dictator, you know, trying to conquer or take back the world for himself, you know, wiping out his enemies along the way. And the good news of what we see in Jesus is that God is none of those things. That God actually breaks all paradigms and all expectations as the God who comes uh, not through force, but through humility, gentleness, love, and peace to enter our world and our lives humbly. And this is the God that we can open up to and we can embrace together at Easter. This is the unexpected God that wants to change our lives today. And if this is the God that we can uh, embrace together because of the unexpected king that we see in Jesus, uh, this is also the God that we are invited to emulate together in our faith. That if Jesus is the unexpected king who comes riding in humbly on a donkey, we are invited to be subjects that emulate his humility and his sacrifice and his service as well. I wonder how unexpectedly different our lives would be if we took on that posture in our our lives and in our faith. You know, how would our relationships look unexpectedly different, whether it's in friendship or in families or, or maybe in marriages, if rather than always trying to have to sort of fight for our way, we just had this default operating setting in the way of Jesus to surrender our way for the sake of the other. Or how would our parenting look unexpectedly different or, or our coaching or our teaching, our, our investing in the next generation if we weren't always trying to control you know, our kids or the next generation, but rather we were looking to, to serve, 
um, and nurture and encourage and empower and unleash the next generation? How would our workplaces look unexpectedly different if we weren't uh, always striving for the promotion ourselves, but we were looking around to see who we could encourage the promotion of, maybe even into positions or roles that we could may otherwise have? And ultimately, how would um, the church and those who identify as followers of Jesus look unexpectedly different if we didn't believe our job was to try to prove that we're right or force our faith on others or feel like we needed to be sort of in power and control if the world's going to be the way it needs to be. And instead, we embrace the unexpected way of Jesus to lay down our lives in service of others, taking the most lowly place in his unexpected kingdom. We live in a world where we have come to expect that there is just always some dude on a horse. Um, but the good news today is that the God of the universe chose to ride a donkey. If that's what we can embrace this Palm Sunday. It's made me think as I was reflecting on this th this week that um, maybe Palm Sunday would have been more aptly named Donkey Sunday. Um, that we would have helped us get the point, but I could see how it doesn't have quite the same ring in the church calendar, or there may have been some other synonyms that maybe be would have become associated with it, but I want us to know that that's the point. That in an unexpected way, the God of the universe through Jesus took the lowliest place, demonstrated as he went into the events of Easter that would change the world forever, that he was coming to bring a different kind of kingdom, an unexpected kingdom that comes through service and sacrifice. That's the God that we can open up to, to embrace together this Easter. That's the God and the King that is inviting us to emulate his way and his life into the world. So may we be people and followers of Jesus who follow the lead of that unexpected king, not as a king who came as some dude on a war horse, but as a humble and loving, sacrificial servant riding on a donkey. Let's pray together. Jesus, we thank you for who you are and all that you have done. And we thank you for the ways you break into our lives and our world in such unexpected ways, revealing a God who is probably so unexpected that we, we still just want to keep learning how to, how to tap into understanding his love for us. May we embrace who you are and what you've done more fully, even today, this week, and in this Easter season. And may we be compelled to em emulate you not being people who live our faith by force, but who participate with you in living our faith through sacrificial love. Thank you that that's what you've done for us, and we look forward to continuing to celebrate this together this week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take a couple minutes to let this get personal before we conclude this morning. Can you imagine what it would have been like to be an Ezraite that day, confident that the prophecies were being fulfilled, that the Messiah was coming to save you from Roman oppression, and then seeing the king that actually showed up in Jerusalem? Really? This guy? On a donkey? This was supposed to be the moment. I'd probably feel let down, confused, or maybe even angry. You ever been there where your expectations of God don't actually line up with your experience of God? Like the Israelites, our expectations of God can be blind spots, deeply embedded assumptions that we don't even know we have. They can leave us feeling frustrated, let down, angry. The thing about blind spots is we don't realize we have them. And so, although we may not think we view God as coercive and controlling, our spiritual life and our actions may tell us something different. And it can be difficult to travel inwards and do the hard work of figuring that out. What motivates you to spend time with Jesus, for example? Is it genuine desire? Or does something deep inside you perhaps motivate you with fear or obligation? What about when you miss the mark? Do you respond to yourself with gentleness? Or do you feel guilt and shame? If you're honest with yourself, what paradigms of God might you need to undo when you really consider these types of questions? How do you personally need to more deeply embrace the unexpected God?
there's a strong link between our perceptions of God and the way we live out God to the world around us. And Jeff invited us to emulate this unexpected God through our lives, allowing friendships and marriages to be driven by concern for others' needs. Parenting that encourages more than it controls work, that celebrates others more than it competes with them. Let's take another moment just to reflect on how we can apply this personally. Try and get really practical with yourself. How could you more deeply emulate the unexpected God in your life? Unexpected God, we come before you desiring humility, recognizing that without your work in our lives, our pictures of you and actions on behalf of you will never be complete. And so we ask for your grace through Christ Jesus to enable our hearts, minds, and souls to know you deeply so that we might reveal a clearer picture of you to the world around us. Amen. prophets had foretold the coming of a mighty king who reigned from heaven's throne but you didn't come in power or politics no your kingdom looked a lot more like a humble crucifix dreams were left hanging on the cross when we were convinced we weren't enough boy you showed us that we're worthy of the greatest act of love you're so much better than we thought you're the After three days lying in the tomb A breath of resurrection power And the grave became a womb And all creation now is born again Cause the story isn't finished yet No, this is not the end You're so much better
We are a community of imperfect people who desire to put into practice the good news that we preach. Our faith is not about an hour of watching or attending. It's about a lifestyle of full devotion to Christ. Not just a something to believe in, but someone to follow. We don't want to talk a good game on Sunday only to remain unaffected or ineffective for the rest of the week. So while we gather each week to sing, pray, listen, and learn, we know that an hour a week will never produce the life change that we so desperately need. It requires a daily investment of time and training. It takes practice. And practice. And more practice. And when we mess up, we forgive ourselves and each other. Then help each other up and keep practicing. As we go now, into the rest of our week. May we not just be hearers of the word, but doers also. May the Spirit of God fill us to make us kind and compassionate, honest and humble, generous and hospitable. Those who repay evil with good. Respond to injustice with action. Overcoming despair with hope. Let us be known, not by what we're against, but by what and who we are for. And most of all, let us love one another. Because God is love. It's been good to be together. But now, it's time for us to go. In the name of the Father, who loves us unconditionally. In the name of the Son, who restores our true humanity. And in the name of the Spirit, who empowers us to live life to the full. Amen. 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 Thanks for joining us today. We hope you felt inspired and challenged by our time together. Now, we know that for what we've heard today to become reality in our daily lives, it's going to take more than just a one hour a week time that we spend together. It requires a moment by moment, seven days a week commitment to practice the way of Jesus and the way of peace. That's why we provide a host of ways to continue to lean into God's presence while we're away from each other. As always, you can click the Practice This Week button below the player for daily spiritual exercises to continue to develop those muscles we started building today. If it helps, you can also opt into our spiritual practices notifications on our app to get those helpful reminders every morning as you start your day. As our time together ends, we're going to put some questions up on the screen. If you're watching with others, they can serve as a great conversation starters, but they can also be a great way of processing and personalizing what you've heard today on your own. And if you'd like a more personal conversation with someone about anything going on in your life, we invite you to reach out to one of our location pastors who will follow up with you privately. Simply fill out the Connect card, which you can find on our website or on the app. That's all for now. Thanks for joining us, and have a great week. Mm -hmm.